So interestingly, we're seeing a really sharp um, increase in the oxygen concentration here as we've been moving downhill. It's not a big magnitude change, but it's a really sharp um, variation in terms. It only jumped two micro, oh, two and a half, uh, I guess now three micromoles per liter, um, but it was a really hard change when we came off the top of this feature and started downhill. That's good. That's a, actually one of the sharper oxygen concentration chains I remember ever seeing while staying like at a relatively similar depth. The water temperature has also had a corresponding reasonable move. Question from Quebec, Canada. Do we have to worry about getting uh, tangled up in fishing lines? Uh, yeah, that is 100% a concern for ROVs broadly. Um, but it uh, out here, there we haven't seen any fishing gear. We've only seen one piece of marine debris that I remember on our watch. I haven't heard from the other watches they've seen any. Um, but in areas that are heavily fished um, or canyons where the that kind of flush all the debris off the shelf down into it, unquestionably entanglement is a, is a real danger um, to ROVs. Can we zoom sponge? I was actually um, on an expedition and we tangled up an undersea communications cable oh. uh, very badly. It was really, really dicey for a few minutes there. It was, um, the cable was strung across a submarine canyon and we were working in the submarine canyon and the cable was 300 meters off the bottom suspended from one side of the canyon to the other. Oh, and uh, we didn't know it, but our 6-8 cable was rubbing against it, and we tried to recover. We, uh, that's all I need, thanks. Or if you, if, you, if you got a moment, we'll take a close zoom and see if anyone's home. Um, and we ended up pinning uh, our version of Argus against the, between the seafloor and the cable in the corner on the side of the wall, and it was scary. All right, that's great, thank you. But none of us ever imagined that a submarine cable would be spanning the top of the canyon at 300 meters above the water column, or 300 meters above the bottom. Was it debris, or was it there intentionally? It was a you no. Know, it was a functional cable. Oh. The amazing thing is, I actually went back and looked, and we could see it in the water, the multi-beam water column data. Actually, detected it on one single ping. Wow. You could see it, and we had actually cleaned it out, thinking it was a bad ping. But that still kind of amazed me that the you know, two inch diameter cable actually had made a return big enough for the whole mounted sonar to see, but just never would have expected to see something like that. But happy ending, everything turned out fine, but there was more than a few tense moments there. And it was really awesome. The co-pilot who was operating the winch noticed the tension on the winch spike instantaneously and stopped winching up. Had they not been paying attention on the ascent uh, we probably would have lost the vehicles. I will add that to the list of things to <laughs> watch out for. You're two thirds of the way through, though.
Oh, is that an acorn, acorn worm? Nope, sea cucumber. If that's counter to your direction of travel, we don't need to go look at it. One of the interesting kind of, I don't know, par paradox is too strong of a word, but decisions in making is we're trying to figure out how better to predict we, where we will find um, high abundance or high diversities of life in the deep sea, whether that be corals or fish or anything. And we're getting reasonably good at knowing where it's not going to be, but we're still a long way of knowing where they're going to be. Um, and so we had a pretty good idea that the saddle was probably not going to be as interesting as some of the other areas we are targeting on this dive. But there's also that part of the scientific process of we really have to go to make sure, and we're ground truthing out here. And so scientifically, it is important sometimes to come out to these sandy areas and see what we see and make sure that our interpretation of the sonar data is correct and that these are going to be broader, sandier areas this time. It looks like our sonar interpretation was correct. This is an urchin. This is we similar, very similar to the one, probably the same species we collected a few uh, dives ago. That um, we got a lot of measurements from the Raman spectrometer, uh, trying to see what pigments in uh, the different animals um, are down here that are detectable by uh, Raman and laser-induced fluorescence. We uh, are hoping to have two more dives uh, on this expedition. One will be uh, on the shallower side with the spectrometer, and the second one will probably be on a little bit on the deeper side as we explore the uh, final seamount uh, of this expedition, which we will transit to probably through the day tomorrow um, and recover in about 12 hours, 12, 13 hours at the end of this dive. Uh, I don't think we figured that out, but it would make sense, I guess, probably for you for washing the cable and stuff if the second, the last one was deeper, yes? Okay, we can try and make that happen. Okay. Uh, we haven't figured it out yet. Probably somewhere in the 18 to 2500 for the deep one, and then shallower in 1500, obviously, for the ramen dive. What's your gizmo's death rating? Cool. Right. How deep can it go? Okay. Yeah. That could be cool. Some of you are online. Yeah, in a couple of years we could be yeah. exploring under the ICCs of Europa. 
Um, That'd be nice. That is actually one of the possible things that the Raman spectrometer will be used for. So in fact, um, Impossible Sensing and the LaserBot team were talking to a group of people from NASA today about its potential for icy world exploration. I, for one, am very excited to see what's going to be underneath those big icy sheets. It would be absolutely amazing as if they drill down and all of a sudden something just swims by and takes a big chunk out of the camera. That'd be so cool. Do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. But still, what's going to be underneath those ice sheets? Yeah, will do. A hard question, but about what degree of steepness is this? Because from the camera, it looks like it's really steep. urchin. No? See cucumber. QC cucumber, yep. I seem to have lost my connection to my um, three-dimensional sonar data um, back here. Oh, no. <coughs> but it, the maximum slope on this entire feature was uh, 23 degrees at a 30-meter grid size. So, so not that um, strong so of a Yep. Of a slope. So this is probably at most 20 or 25 degrees slope. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, according to my bathymetry here, for if we're traveling uh, sort of in the XY direction at 150 meters, we're descending just 50 meters over that length. I was trying to, yeah, but I seem to have lost the KVM connection to it. Yep. Beautiful shot here yeah. of the swimming sea cucumber. They're always so mesmerizing to watch swim. Oh, you're right. Ooh, game suggestion. Endless Ocean Blue World for Nintendo Wii. The Orfish was this viewer's favorite. I do enjoy playing Nintendo Wii, even though it's a little bit old now. They're so fun. with the arm. <laughs> Bash stuff with it. <laughs> it's always yeah. fun to kick rocks. $250,000 hammer. Daryl, question for you. Uh, if you got time, I'll take the zoom. But if, I'm, if you're in a hurry, I'm sure. pretty sure I know what it is. Go ahead, Are there, 
Are there any really good um, deep sea video games? Yes. That's that bamboo we just sampled. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, the one I can think of right now is Nautica. Uh, that's a pretty good one. If you want to go actually deep into the ocean, that's pretty cool. Yes, please. Um, still trying to think of other games, but some Nautica is probably the best one. They, they even have a Sub-Zero version where you're under the ice, and so it's kind of cool to use to play that game too. Awesome. Yep. There's a new game under development that's, I think, in beta test called Sub ROV, where you actually are set up in a control room like this and you get to operate uh, the ROV just like we are out here. I haven't played it yet, but I've, I know a few people who have, so it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, yeah. <coughs> My kids have played it and they said it needs, uh, it needs a Halloween aspect, to, like a scary aspect. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were, thought it was pretty boring. have random creatures appear and go up against the lens and stuff. Jump scares. I would say maybe a couple of snailfish just cruising by. They're creepy and cool. Anyone ever play Iron Lung? Polio? <laughs> no, it's a, a it's a small, a little short indie horror game where you're piloting a uh, submersible vehicle. I won't say any more to not give away the plot, but I highly recommend you check it out. I'm not a video game player, so what is it about? Look up just a bit for us, or come up. No spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. I don't own any gaming equipment. <laughs> I think the last game I played was Mario Kart. It's a good one. Uh, I'm not good at the game. Uh. Oh, we have a game suggestion. Soma, made by Frictional Games. It's a horror game that takes an undersea science there? facility. Sure. And involves walking around on the ocean floor uh, at multiple points. Go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, let's sample that one, too. Right. What is this one? I have no idea. Oh, okay. It's really cool the way it's branching out. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I want to say Chrysogorgid, but it's different. Is this going to be Snip and Slurp? I think so, yeah. Copy. Turn curve. Tight there for a second, Daryl. You all right over there? Yeah. Is uh, something wrong? <laughs> no, just wasn't sure how close we were. No, we're good. Altitude is good, and obstacles are a healthy distance. Right. I would recommend probably two smaller snips so the branches don't get um, caught up if we've got time for it. Right here. Yeah, these dainty little tiny polyps with low, s low um, the not a lot of tissue on the skeleton makes me think Chrysogorgid. Um, potentially something in the Pleurogorgia genus, but we have the color of the skeleton is a little a really small snip. Weird for that. And, okay, uh, go with. And the branching pattern is a little different too. 
We have somebody online who is just suggesting uh, Ramola Gorgia Militaris. Which is what they, yeah, which is what they've changed um, Plora Gorgia into. Can you zoom in there for me? Let's see if I can put it in backwards here. Uh, zoom right in there. Looks like you lost it. Oh, it's there, this yeah. little tiny. Oh, super tiny. tiny. Wow. I said tiny. Uh, yeah. He <laughs> took that quite literally. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can turn on the... Give me uh, 50% there. Copy that. Okay, yeah, 50%. Uh, go 100. We're Copy. Okay, T4 is 100%. Oh, there it goes. All right, another piece a little bigger, please. Roger. Okay. I'm dumping flow like crazy here. Zoom back in there for us. Yeah, okay, that's good. Something like that. Or even a little more. There you go. That looks great. Thank you. I see the first snip in jar four. Right here. What's the sample number, please? Sample 163. 163. Uh, go right there. Thank you. I have an obstacle approaching my front. I have to winch up ever so slightly. Right there, you can start winching up. You Co pull me off now, it's no big deal. Copy that. You uh, turn off the slurp for a second. Copy. T4 is at 0%. <laughs> See the camera start going faster. Okay, uh, Daryl, zoom in for us. Okay, give me 100% again. Okay, you have 100%. goes. We're uh, low chairing here. <laughs> oh, I see it. it. Is. Okay, excellent. Kill it. Thank you. Go okay. to the next jar. T4 is off. Next jar is jar Short. three. Uh, skip that one. Okay. Let's, I thought we were going to get rid of that. Oh, yeah. I'll go back to door three, sorry. Copy. Yeah, one and two have the uh, yeah. small mesh. We might have to play with it a bit to get it to go clockwise. Let me go that stick here. Okay. So a couple of video game suggestions yeah, that viewers have uh, written. I'll deal with that. You come up on your... Abzu the game and Titanic Challenge of Discovery, where you dive an ROV to explore the Titanic, Bismarck, and other stuff. And of course, I Subnautica. Shouldn't have had you go past, sorry.
Brian, do the corals that we snip, do they no, regenerate? Uh, you can make a note in the book when you get a chance to... I don't know if they regenerate, but they certainly can seal that wound and continue to grow healthily. Like, I don't... The, the couple of times we have checked on corals later or come back, the corals do just fine as a... Make organism. a note in the log to give the uh, rotisserie some love. Temple door, rotary, gizmo. But I don't know, I don't know, and I'd be a little surprised if that particular branch regrew. Now, if we cut a brittle star arm off in the sampling process, it'll totally regrow. And another question, is there anything down in this deep that would be worth, that would be edible or worth harvesting? Probably, there's probably things that are edible, but I don't think they would really be worth harvesting for food. Be the most expensive mouthful you've ever had? Not well, even a let me, actually, let me take that back. I did just see an article the other day that about uh, a restaurant in Taipei that's starting to serve yep, giant ice pop. Which could be down the steep, yeah. <laughs> that sounds interesting. They're probably harvesting them from shallower, but um, but no, most of the things down here are really oily and fatty, and for the fish, uh, and kind of gooey, and would not have a good. Um, texture and probably would taste pretty bad. But, it, you know, but it, it in deep sea, but in the deep sea, you know, deeper than 200 meters, there certainly are commercially viable and harvestable species at the two to like th 200 to like 1,000 meter range, absolutely. There's crabs, there's different types of fish, orange roughy, swordfish. Um, fish at that depth. So there is plenty of commercially important and viable species in the deep sea. Just once you get down to 2,500 to 3,000, it gets pretty thin. Yeah. And I believe we found the sun. It's kind of interesting. Look how the pillows got immediately rounded right there and kind of compressed. I think that is the most pointy pinnacle I've ever seen in, a, in one of these features. Like normally you get up to the top and it's kind of like just generically flat, you don't really know where the high point is, but I think we literally found the high point. And not a rock to be had. I'm sorry, Amber. I know. You said, you called it. Still going down the other side, so maybe then. Yep. <laughs> so this was just like a s little mound. Now we're going to go down a little bit and then back up the other side? Yep, we're probably going to go explore some sand here for a little bit as we go through a saddle um, that's pretty flat. And then we will should reacquire another rocky slope on the other side as we climb the main summit of the seamount. If my bathymetry whispering is right. I'm surprised at how abrupt this transition appears to be to like what it looks like on the right side of the screen versus what's on the left. In terms of rock formation, that's kind of cool. I'm 
just visual. I'm trying to envision all of this being lava running, and like what this would look like when it was formed a hundred and whatever million years ago. Be careful! You're starting to sound like a geologist. I do have a <laughs> minor in geology. <laughs> I appreciate the rocks they make home for the lo other things. Mm -hmm. Tim, I'm right there with you about video games. Corley, are there is there any potential for precious gemstones down here? Uh, even olivine? Um, olivine, sure. That would be found in the basaltic rock, though. Would there potentially be any other gemstones like a ruby and rolled sapphire? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, most of those are metamorphic, are they not? Yeah. I don't even know how those are formed, to be honest. I never think about those. <laughs> Both of those are metamorphic. Oh, wow, good job. So, no, this is all igneous and sedimentary rock. You could get, it'd be really, it would be really uncommon to get a metamorphic rock. Uh, What's a good example of a metamorphic rock? Asbestos. Asbestos <laughs> is a metamorphic rock. It's a, uh, I know about it because I used to work yeah, with any it. Of those jumble yeah, rocks wait, I'm wondering if some of these rocks actually. Can we poke any of these? Yep. Honestly, anything. That one. That looks big. Too big? No, it's fine. I was just oh, okay. I was joking. I thought you were. I was. Joking about that. <laughs> this, this whole, yeah, so that's <laughs> this whole thing. When you first pointed, that's what I thought you were pointing at. <laughs> no, this, the this one right here. <gasps> really? Exciting day. I think it. I think. Oh, <laughs> wait. The one that you're you're moving one in the still cam. I think it's like one right in. I mean, obviously that's too big, but. Yep, that's free. So I think this one is free too, probably. I mean. Which do you want? I mean, can we try for the big one, or? If it'll Oops. fit the large oh. aft bio box is still open. If it'll fit in there. Yeah. Nice. That's a good rock. It's a good rock. Good Great big rock. <laughs> Bonus rock. Bonus rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two rocks Get for shots. the price of one. Get All right. Shots. We're good. Stick in a box. It took me a second to get the joke, Amber, sorry. Uh, no, just the aft one. Um, but yeah. No metamorphic rocks down here. What causes a metamorphic rock? Like, I learned about this back when I was in fifth grade, and I have not used it since. High temperature and pressure. So you take an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock, and uh -huh. you subject it to high temperatures and pressures, and it's going to change. Uh, temperature and pressure is so high that it'll change the mineralogy of those rocks into something different. But it has to... It can't melt, because once it melts and cools again, then that's considered an igneous rock. So like how a diamond is carbon, and then it gets 
placed under a high amount of pressure, would that be considered metamorphic? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Like, <laughs> Sorry, I was like how a diamond is carbon and then it's just high amounts of pressure, make it into a diamond. Mm -hmm. Is that considered metamorphic? Awesome. Um, I don't know. I've never thought about that before. Yep, exactly. I do remember the science lab I did when I learned about this. I So here's the thing. I never think about metamorphic rocks. It is like the last type of rock I think about. They are so cool though. Like, ask any sedimentologist or igneous petrologist. Um, metamorphic rocks are probably some of the coolest rocks to look at, but they're very, it's not what I, not what I do. Yeah, you're an igneous rock, basaltic rock kind of person. I'm a hydrogenetic, crusty rock type of person right now. <laughs> what is a hydrogenetic? Hydro meaning water, genetic meaning like DNA. Um, meaning, meaning like what it's made out of. So it's like made oh. from the seawater. Fermanganese mm -hmm. crust is hydrogenetic. Yeah. Like genesis being the root. Oh, okay. Not genetic. Genesis. Well, it's called hydrogenetic rock. But it's Jenny, meaning like Genesis. Yeah, like how it was formed. Cool. Which I think is also the root of, gen root of genetic. Oh, is it really? That's awesome. I could awesome. be wrong about that, but that's always my been my assumption. I should probably know this because I was looking up an article on Ancestry.com earlier today after our conversation from yesterday. Oh yeah, gene or gin me is the Latin word for born or produce.
Looks like a little anemone or something here hanging out in the sand. Sea anemone? Yep. That's a pretty one. Hey, Lynette, so the other night you were talking about um, how you do navigation, and but we were on a more shallower dive. Are there any different challenges to diving so deep like we're out here? Yeah, um, so I think the biggest challenge with a deeper dive is that we just have more cable out, um, so everything reacts a little bit slower. Every time we move the ship, it takes a little bit longer for Atalanta to react to those movements. Um, so that's something that we really have to take into consideration when we're planning our moves. Um, if we find something that we want to stomp on real quick, it's not always <laughs> so easy. Um, but we do our best and backtrack if we need to. So yeah, I think that's the biggest, biggest challenge with the deeper water dives. Awesome. Thank you, Lynette. Yeah. Chris, when you're out on Palmyra and the, uh, the surrounding islands, do you ever see any basaltic pillow lava formations when you go scuba diving or snorkeling? No. Most of the um, formations around there are all from coral, like build up on corals. So um, the islands themselves are built up coral reefs mm -hmm. that have come past the surface and have been there long enough that sediment has accrued on there, like sand and things, deep enough for trees and other plants to grow. And the, the more basalt and all the, those kind of rocks will be in the center of the lagoon way at the bottom, probably. So once those all break down and everything descends below the surface of the sea, you end up more with these kind of seamounts. How deep is the uh, center lagoon? Uh, the deepest part I think is around 280 feet. Oh, that oh. deep. Huh. Yeah. There's a couple of like uh, deep cone, like uh, like the lava cones or the volcanic cones. Uh -huh. they're, they're, they go pretty deep. Wow. But the average depth I think in the, the right, right in front of the station is about 180. That's really a lot deeper than I was expecting. thought it was going to be pretty shallowish, like 60, 80 feet. Oh. Do you ever get to do any scuba diving out there, or is it just uh, primarily snorkeling? Mm, pretty much mostly snorkeling. Every once in a while, um, we'll get a chance to go for a little, a little dive, but I think I've only gotten to do that twice. I would imagine that would be hard, um, taking the oxygen tanks back and forth, or do you have like a, a way to fill up the oxygen tanks on the island? Yeah, we have two compressors on station. Compressors, there we so, go. Yeah, we, um, so we can fill, I think we've got about 30 tanks, and oh. uh, yeah, we've, we can fill them on station. So. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. That's good for us. That's a... You saw a fish? Yeah. Oh, right about now the I see it. Yeah. Anatomy. This is an anatomy, right? See, we're going to make a geologist, I'm a biologist out of your anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting excited about fish. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a little cuskiel. <laughs> you 
check out the whip real quick. Ted stock with crinoids. Two Comachula crinoids hanging out on what I think is probably a dead sponge dock. All right, thanks. Is this our first crinoid for the night? No, but we haven't seen many. So the next 100 and couple, 100, 200 meters is gonna be a little slow going um, as we traverse down slope, which is not an ideal direction for RVs to go. So we have to take it a little slow and we'll be a little further off the bottom than usual. As we work downhill, we try really hard to avoid downhill slopes when we plan these dives. Um, but in order to get the depth range we wanted to on this dive and get the maximum amount of steeper slope that has the highest likelihood of having exposed hard grounds, it made sense for the overall dive track here to include this little downhill section that I'll we'll just have to get through the annoyance and then uh, and then we'll get back to good ROV video soon. much lovely sand. Oh, it's a bioturbation. Yeah, you're picking, there's some, some tracks in here, which is, I've been pretty interested in comparison the last couple of days about the different sediment types and how um, the detritivores that live on the sediment um, seem to have a strong preference for the finer grain sediments than the denser sand, or coarser grain sands. after seeing more acorn worms than I've ever seen in my life <laughs> yeah, two days ago. I believe 12 to 4 said they saw one, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Question, is motion sickness an, an issue out here? Absolutely. Uh, and do we ever have any trouble sleeping after the shift is over? Uh, sometimes, yeah, certainly. I always get really, really sleepy when I get seasick. Yeah, same. The funny flip side of seasickness is land sickness. Oh, yeah. It's much, much, much less severe, um, but I definitely dock rock? have found myself mm -hmm. catching dock rock a few times um, after right. being at sea for a month and being like, wait, why isn't anything moving? <laughs> I actually feel it most in the shower. The first shower That's I take right on shore, yeah. um, I've, I've almost fallen out of the shower once. <laughs> <laughs> Same, always in the shower. Yeah, it's always in the shower. You feel the dock rock. I've never gotten dock rock before. Well, consider really? yourself lucky. I got it last year on the flight back to Texas so bad. Like something about being in the air, airplane, I was not a happy It seems camper. to be confined spaces is where Maybe, it's yeah. worse. Okay. Well, good luck. Um. Yeah, thanks. Um, the other thing that I'm always amazed, it doesn't, it doesn't happen to me always, I'm hoping it'll happen this cruise because we've been so far you know, at sea, but is when you smell land. Um, when you get so acclimatized to the ocean smell that you, you get within you know, dozens of miles of land, you realize you're like, what's that stinky smell? <laughs> and you're like, I've oh, that's land. Hawaii is a great place for it to smell it. I think the most strong I've ever smelled was coming back into Honolulu. These are things I've never experienced before. I've never been like, mm, gross, <laughs> land. <laughs> <laughs> I like, don't even know what 
everyone's like, oh, it smells like ocean or boat out here. I'm like, I don't even know what that smells like. <laughs> Maybe this is the cruise for it. Maybe. We're yeah. going to get Maybe, Doc Rock yeah. and uh, gross smells for here's, land. Here's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I do have to say that's probably the hardest thing about getting adjusted back to being on a boat is the boat smells. Like, especially going to the bathroom. <laughs> I always, like, I'm kind of glad that they have the mask protocol in place for the fi first five days so I can smell my mask instead of smelling, like, boat smell so I can slowly weed my way in. Just doing a little engineering here. Love it. Oh, a person, a uh, retired Navy is saying that they have been there, done that with the sea legs versus land legs. Isn't that why Johnny Depp walks so strangely <laughs> in the Caribbean? His hands out for balance. <laughs> So speaking of smells, last night, since we were mapping instead of doing a watch, um, we had foot baths in our, oh. in our cabin. Don't worry, the, the little bubbler wasn't on. But we had like some beautiful smelly stuff. And oh my gosh, the cabin smelled like amazing. Essential oils and stuff. Yes, essential oils, Epsom salts with lavender. Sounds lovely. It yeah. really was lovely. It was great. Samantha laid out um, some magazines for us to read. It was the coolest thing. Take a look. Oh, wow. Isn't that so sweet? That looks nice. Yeah. It was really, really nice just sitting there reading a magazine, feet soaking, and then our cabin smelled so good, so relaxing. Captain's Pharaoh walk. That. Well, we are back into the zone in which is much better sampled, so I won't be quite as grab happy. Three D print something. Well, is it better than nothing?
I always wonder when I see these feeding traces or paths that then just kind of disappear, whether the sea cucumber swam away or if it was eaten or if it just stopped feeding and so it was a little lighter and wasn't digging a trace or whatever. When you see all of these traces that kind of start and stop, I always wonder where the thing that made them was. Question on from online, is this terrain change what was expected? Yeah, this is uh, pretty pretty much what we would have expected here. I guess I didn't expect the sediment to start quite this early, uh, this high up, but I definitely expected to get into some serious sediment here in this saddle between the local high we're leaving and uh, the, uh, the next up incline. Do any jellyfish make it down this far? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we've seen we've seen several um, little flit in and out of the camera in the corners, tiny ones that uh, we haven't gotten a good look at. But um, but yeah, Tina fours and jellyfish unquestionably still get down here. If you if you watch the Atalanta view um, on stream two, you'll see lots of little gelatinous organisms. I just saw some kind of mucus house, maybe a larvation or something through. Here's a rat tail. Oh, a just a little, little guy. He's just a little baby. So I've been reading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea since we have several copies on board. <laughs> uh, the chapter I was just reading was talking about how the Pacific Ocean is a calm ocean. Oh, it totally is. It 100% is. That's why it's called Pacific. Like, pacify, like, calm. But I'm like, aren't the some of the largest waves, not the largest, but some of the largest recorded from out here? It wouldn't surprise me, but a lot of, uh, I mean, the typhoons can get huge. And so when storms come, it absolutely can get really gnarly. One of the biggest seas I've ever been in was out here. Um, but it, the only way I can describe it is it feels like it has more inertia. Like it just doesn't change all that quick. You can have a squall line come through and the seas will pick up a little bit, but it's not too bad. Unlike the Gulf of Mexico, which goes from flat calm to, um, to like super, super short period choppy waves in just minutes that is the largest ocean so it's got a lot more mass so mm -hmm. it takes a while a lot more for it to get that moving the, phys the physics of that i mean like that's an easy kind of answer but if you think about the physics of that it doesn't make sense they're all deep water waves like once you're over here it shouldn't matter right like i agree that's what it feels like but if you're actually thinking about the physics involved in it that doesn't make sense so i don't understand it but Talk to a physical oceanographer. <laughs> Have it out with them. Maybe. I feel this is literally, I don't even know why I'm saying this, because this is my own idea. <laughs> There's really no scientific basis. But I feel like the Pacific Ocean is so much bigger than the Atlantic Ocean. So in the Atlantic Ocean, you're able to feel a lot more of the currents and the Coriolis-like effect of the currents or something in a small area compared to a big area, everything is more dispersed. But again, that's- See, I just don't, I, and I, I agree that's what it feels like, but I just don't think the physics on that really work out. <laughs> but I'm not a physical oceanographer, so I don't, I definitely don't know. But I do much, much prefer being in this ocean. I don't mind the Atlantic, I avoid the Gulf of Mexico, oh, I and I try Gulf and go to the Pacific. Bad. 
just for the wave actions in the Gulf? People get very seasick yeah, in the Gulf it's and just don't get not, seasick anywhere yep. else. Oh. There's no swell, and so it's all wind wave, and it yep. gets super choppy. Yes, it does. I will 100% agree there. I have a professor who went on a cruise um, to the Gulf of Mexico, somewhere in the Gulf Stream, I forgot where, um, but like said that she felt like she was in a washing machine yeah. the entire time. <laughs> Angry little bathtub. All right. Jeez. You know, we can we can dive the RV in nine, ten foot swells out here sometimes, like nine or twelve feet, nine or ten feet in the Gulf of Mexico, and we're running for shore. Um, that the wave period and the, the the size of the swell is so different in the than the two basins. I'm glad to hear you say that, because like I remember when I first moved up to New England after working on the Gulf. And some of the old timers up there kind of were, I don't know how to say it like respectfully, but um, did not believe that the Gulf of Mexico had those bad storms. And so I was like, ah, oh, the worst storm I've ever been in was only six foot waves, but it was just a horrible, yep. horrible storm. Yeah, like I, don't, I don't understand why, but it definitely that's been my experience is the wave height in the Gulf of Mexico is Feet is, I think it's just shorter period and steeper, mm -hmm. steeper waves, and, and you know it just beats you up faster. Yeah, yeah. And the Gulf also has some screwy currents, very screwy currents. You can get 90 degree current changes in the matter of 10 minutes if you're sitting there in DP, um, holding station. Like you can have a easterly current, and just next thing a minute you've got a, a super strong current coming out of due north. Whereas out here the current's pretty consistent. Where you find it in the morning is where you find it in the afternoon. I'm assuming that also explains why there's so many shipwrecks out in the Gulf. It is easy to get trapped in the Gulf too. If you've got a hurricane coming, there's not a whole lot of places you can escape because there's you're kind of a there's land everywhere. <laughs> Here, if you're fast enough, you can always find open water in some direction. If you are lucky enough to pick the right direction and fast enough in the Gulf, you pretty much kind of get stuck between the storm and, and the coast somewhere. I've ridden out three hurricanes now. I've run away from two or three on <laughs> ships in the Gulf and South Atlantic, or you know, North Atlantic, but the Southern part of the US. Mm -hmm. We never got anywhere close, but we definitely had to turn tail and run a couple times. The biggest seas I've ever seen was out here in the Pacific. We were about 100 miles, 150 miles south of Midway, um, way on the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And the weather forecast came in and it was supposed to be like 20 foot seas. Jeez. And we were gonna run as hard as we could due south to try and find 17 foot seas. Oh. And we were, it was been a miserable expedition. We'd gotten like no work done, um, basically. And, um, and we were running out of time. All right, that's that same Chrysogorgid we just sampled. All right, thank you. Um, and I, I talked the captain of the ship into staying where we were. I was like, look, we're going to run 200 miles south and maybe get like a meter less wave size, or we can stay here right out. The, uh, can we zoom with the black coral at the top too, please? Um, you, we can stay here right out the 20 foot seas and maybe still get one more, R, one or two RV dives before we had to go. We had like a 2,000 mile transit to the Marshall Islands to end the cruise. So we stayed and the forecast was wrong and we got up to 30 foot seas. Jesus. I was not a popular person on the ship. <laughs> oh. That's good, thank you. Would that be the worst storm you've ever been in? Oh yeah. Foot? Luckily we weren't in the storm itself. It was a storm moved north of Midway and so we were just catching super big waves. We weren't actually in that heavy of a wind. I mean, it was a good blow, but it wasn't 
30 foot seas below of a blow. It was like 30 knots and 30 foot seas. And they had already sorted out and were a decent period. So it really wasn't as terrible as it sounds, but it was impressive. What is Point Nemo? Point Nemo is the, I guess it's not theoretical, but uh, the point in the, su in the South Pacific that is f the furthest away from land you can be anywhere. And I forget how far away what that actually is, but it's several thousand miles from any point of land. Um, so it's the most oceanic point in the world. And it's also where most space agencies deorbit old aircraft and target. Um, so it's becoming a graveyard for derelict spacecraft. I would say that that sounds like a cool place to go and visit, but <laughs> in case someone yeah. tries to drop something in there. I mean, the odds of you getting yeah. hit are extremely low even if you're sitting there, but. But never zero. But never zero. Never zero. <laughs> It's about have time for a quick zoom on the sponge. All right, thank you very much. For those that are wondering, yes, we are aware about uh, the live stream data showing up on novelistlive.org. Uh, it's a problem that we've been working on for quite some, or been working on for a bit. Hopefully we'll get it back up and going within the next couple of dives. But yes, we are aware of it. Oh, this is interesting about Point Nemo. So Point Nemo is so isolated that according to the BBC, the closest people are actually on the International Space Station, which is only 258 miles from Earth's surface at any given time. And that's kind of the same as us, right? Yeah, except, that, for, the except for Palmyra. Palmyra. Yeah, yep. I definitely have the Hal, Hal and the Baker in the Phoenix Islands, which are the, are the two US pieces of US territory in the Phoenix Islands. I definitely have been there and made that claim because there's the only inhabited island, the only two inhabited islands in, along the Tokelau Ridge, which are the Phoenix Islands, are Tokelau. Uh, and then there's a caretaker station at Canton in the Phoenix Islands protected area. But that's five or 600 miles south of Howland and Baker. And it's another place that's not anywhere near shipping lanes. So uh, at, an, you know, at that orbital height, definitely sometimes they're the closest other people if they're overhead. We always wave at the space station when it goes by. Mm. <laughs> Let me look at both of these um, corals coming in down here. Uh, well, the, the close one's just a stalk, so never mind. Back one looks like that same one we sampled, the Chrysogorgia, probably formerly known as Pleurogorgia.
Lily, would you say that this texture is botryoidal? I would absolutely say that this texture is botryoidal. Question from online. Great, thank you. If you could go down in Herc in a clear pressurized capsule, would you go? Absolutely, in a heartbeat. Yeah, same here. I am, I am very much looking for an excuse to get to go in a, a deep submergence vehicle with the, that I could either either one like a Triton bubble sub or like a Pisces style um, or Alvin. I would jump at the chance. Yeah, if not to just say that I got to do it, just to be able to see the geology, I think would be really useful. What does James Cameron do with his big old bubble? Uh, he didn't have a bubble. It was a, it was not a bubble, but he had donated to Woods Hole. Oh, okay. And then it caught fire. Oh. <laughs> Well, more specifically, the truck that was carrying it caught fire. Oh my gosh. Good night, and night. destroyed the sub. Oh man. Oh. It's an wow. expensive fire. Yeah. I know. <laughs> So do we have a way of keeping specimens alive at sea level? We do not. Um, some work is being done on that. Um, the Monterey, Re Monterey Bay Research, or no, sorry, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, oh, nice big Cuscule. Cuscule. Um, Monter if we're head on, can we get a good shot of his face and gills before he turns around? Nope, he's gonna turn around anyways. Is that blood at the back end of his tail? Sorry, Katie, what? Just damaged. Like scales yeah. got damaged, yeah. scraped off. Looks like he's gotten a little bit of a scrape with somebody at the back end. It's yep, territorial. It's very possible. He does look like this one has rubbed against a lot of stuff and is a little scratched up. All right, that's good for science, thank you. Um, so back to your question. Um, so Monterey Bay Aquarium has got an exhibit right now for deep sea organisms, uh, and it's really cool. They've really made it doing some absolute pioneering work and hu animal husbandry to keep these things alive, but they are keeping them all at one atmosphere of pressure and just controlling temperature and other um, factors to make them happy. There are a couple groups that have pressure vessels and have tried to bring up corals um, um, and other organisms. Actually, I don't know if they're done corals, but certainly other organisms under pressure. And it's exceedingly difficult and expensive to do, um, but there is a little bit of work do going on about it. I want to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium because apparently they have a touch tank for the giant isopods. How cold would that water be? Like two or three degrees Celsius. Yeah. I mean, ice, truly ice cold. That would be so funny. Like all these little kids, like I want to touch the giant isopod, and then just freezing their little hands. I have to admit, I very much want to see that exhibit too. I forget that uh, 
you folks from the East Coast don't have ready access to the aquarium. I've been to Monterey Bay Aquarium many, many times throughout my undergrad. <laughs> uh, we have whale sharks in, in the Southeast in an aquarium, so. <laughs> see, see your deep sea organism with three whale sharks. I have. I don't have a good response to that. <laughs> that All I have in Tennessee and Chattanooga is a multi-story aquarium. I don't know. You have those giant catfish. I don't know if they're still there, but last time I was at the Chattanooga Aquarium, oh, yeah, there's yeah. a massive catfish, which really blew my mind. They, yeah, I think the last time I visited, which was a year and a half ago, I believe they still had multiple large catfish like i'm like <laughs> if, I, if i caught them on the river i'd be pretty happy texas parks and wildlife has an inland aquarium over in athens and it's got those massive channel cats too they're so neat to just watch swimming around just huge huge fish So if you look out into the into the abyss here uh, from Hercules and see the little white nubbins everywhere, those are all xenophyophores. Oh. Um, the largest unicellular organism. So xenophyophores also settle on the dirt, kind of cover themselves up. Yep. They basically look like sand took in shape. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so Rena, a viewer online, has your counter. But the Monterey Bay has sea otters. Oh, random person online, that's a great point. Atlanta has sea otters, too. <laughs> That's where the whale sharks are, right? Yeah, yeah. I heard it's really cool. A really neat exhibit. Yep, so that little piece of structure there in the center is a single-celled organism that's a couple centimeters across. Super weird from the physiological standpoint that a single cell can sustain that size. So to our xenophilophore fan out there, that was for you. All for you. Stop thinking outside the box, Dan. I know, she's kidding. I will say one of the cool things about the Monterey Bay Aquarium is you can go outside and see, you know, the ocean right there and see natural exhibits outside that are open um, to the bay, which is really cool, which Atlanta does not have. Uh, California, or Monterey Bay Aquarium is also in California, so that's <laughs> a big factor. <laughs> that's a big plus, you know. <laughs> Uh, I have California, West Coast, Supremacy, and all of that. <laughs> Tripod fish coming out of the gloom here. Oh, this is the tall fin one. Are there different species of tripod fish? Oh, yeah. Um, and this one has the really super long fins, and it stands like I was way say, above the sea. Wow. It looks like it's floating. Instead of blue, like the last few ones we've seen, this is gray this time. Wow.
viewer online says that watching along with the dive makes us makes them feel like they are walking on a beach with a flashlight. That's a pretty apt um, analogy. I think uh, my advisor Randy Rogen and I like to use the example of taking a hike up a mountain with a, with a flashlight, being an analogous to under to an ROV dive as we're trying to understand an entire mountain by hiking one trail at night with a flashlight. Oh, hello, well, I just re or realized we only have 23 minutes left. That's a Zeno. Zeno. Uh, viewer online says, is there any way you could estimate how deep the sand is? We actually have a sonar on the ship that could, um, that we haven't been running much because it's frankly a really annoying to, to work with. And unless you're really focused on a specific area, it's, it's not very efficient. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a sub-bottom profiler that is um, a low frequency sonar. It's three and a half kilohertz. Um, actually, we have two frequencies. We have 15 and a three and a half on the ship. Um, and that allows us to see beneath the sediment layers and get a sense of how deep the different layers are, um, but with the ROV, no. Other than pushing a push core in, um, we uh, really don't have a, that good of a, a sense of um, of um, how deep the sediment is. And we've been trying push cores, and the sandy sediment just is not staying in the push cores. an engineer and like sonar processing, making a better operating sub-bottom profiler would be much appreciated. <laughs> A uh, viewer online says that in Australia, the Mel Melbourne Sea Life Aquarium has a huge saltwater crocodile. Oh, okay. Well, that's another thing. If you're in California and you're going to go to Monterey <laughs> Bay Aquarium, then you would also go to San Francisco and you would go to California Academy of Sciences that has an albino alligator. Oh. oh cool. And then in December, they have reindeer. Really? Reindeer? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. They also have this like giant, like what a terrarium, 
yeah. thing like that you can walk through that has a bunch of butterflies and they have a bunch of oh. researchers uh, there who study all different sorts of things but uh, California Academy of Sciences is super cool so if anyone's traveling to San Francisco I highly recommend I'm surprised you're willing to cross the bay <laughs> <laughs> I, I like San Francisco I'll, I'll travel all around the bay well, except I won't go to where Ren is from, <laughs> but... Sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> just just calling out. Where are you from? Menlo Park? So as we move through the sediment here, we're going to do a little pilot training and let Ren fly Herc for a few minutes. Somebody online said that alligators are the puppies of the reptile world, where crocs, on the other hand, are so mean. So during the summer, a lot of times I work at the Texas State Aquarium, and they used to have a huge, huge alligator called Bo. And Bo was illegally shot back when it was younger, like back in the late 90s. And uh, the Texas State Aquarium rehabilitated him, and it got just massive. And Bo was always really pretty gentle. In fact, they had Bo trained to where you could tap its uh, little snout with a ball, and it would follow the, the ball all around the aquarium. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool.
Ooh. One of the oldest and largest crocodiles is called Cassius. And what do you guys eat during an expedition? Everything that you would normally eat on land. I ate some oatmeal raisin cookies earlier, had some fish. Uh, mashed potatoes were really delicious at dinner. And this morning we had bacon and eggs, along with mini corn dogs. I will say one quirk of this expedition has been the amount of calamari. <laughs> it's been a lot of calamari. Not that I'm complaining. I like calamari, but it's been a surprisingly large amount. And no egg rolls. And no egg rolls. Yeah, I was it's very true. surprised that we haven't had that. Perfect. I told Adam I was going to leave him in the middle of the sand. <laughs> but really, we got him most of the way through the sand. Thank you to our, uh, the viewer from San Antonio. I was just up at uh, La Cantera uh, about a month ago. Right before, the weekend before I came out here, I was up there. And any tips for seasickness? Ginger candy, crackers, stay hydrated, and don't worry, it'll pass. Just take the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Do you take Lucid medicine? For the first couple of days on the way, always. Just helps me smooth the transition to get my sea legs back. But yeah, I always take one somewhere between 12 and two hours before the ship gets underway, and sometimes a second one the next day. And then if we're expecting heavier seas or something, I'll take one again in the middle of the cruise. Just keeps the little, little gnawing feeling in my stomach and uh, reduces the headache a little bit for me. Brian, all those little bumps are the xenophyophores? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think all those little bumps we're seeing are, are different xenophyophores. Do they filter the sand for food? Or like, how do they eat? I honestly am not entirely sure. I should know more about them, considering that they're frankly one of the most prevalent things we see down here. Um, I didn't realize that the xenophylophores were in the sand. I thought they were only in the rocky parts. Yeah, I think you actually see them in the sand more. The ones you see on the rocks are, I think, a little bit rarer. Huh. So Brian, uh, going back to seasickness, do you think having a full stomach or an empty stomach is better for seasickness? Somewhere in between. If you let yourself get empty stomach too hungry, I think it's way worse. But being super full doesn't feel good either. I end up eating lots of little snacks. Yeah, sometimes eating helps me with my seasickness. I'll agree.
So as we're nearing the end of our our shift, only a couple more minutes before we start switching out, I was just thinking the snailfish at the beginning of the shift was still the coolest, coolest thing that we've seen for the past four hours, in my opinion. That was the first one I've ever seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. First one outside of, you know, YouTube or Discovery Channel. Right. I did not bring a jacket today, and I am regretting that decision. You're cold? Yeah. Interesting. You're not cold? No. Huh. I don't get cold. <laughs> I live in Rhode Island now. <laughs> Somebody was saying that coffee helps for seasickness, and I, I don't agree. I, with that. Yeah, I respectfully disagree on that. Especially ship's coffee, I feel like it's very acidic. Uh, so yeah, if y'all guys watching on the YouTube rewind it about four hours, you're gonna, or I guess about three and a half, you're gonna see a snailfish. Turn left if you can. See if you can stabilize now. Oh, overshot. Where are you getting dragged? He, do he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> he has better headset. Whew. Good night, North Carolina. <laughs> so everybody listening we are going through a shift change so you, it will be quiet on comps for about the next five ten minutes or so
Did we do change? Good evening chat, 8 to 12, signing in. I hope everyone's having a good morning, afternoon, evening from wherever you are tuning in from. Good evening from the Central Pacific. Hi, Annie. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Amazing. Shout out to Dallas, Texas. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Everyone getting settled. <laughs> Everybody's eight to 12 settling in. Test, test. Yeah. Oh, there I am. Cool. Loud and clear. All right, 8 to 12. How's everybody feeling? Ready to. Ready, ready. ready. Go. Let's go. Let's go. So, science, anything you want to do before we get moving? No. No. Great. Let's go. RV, are we ready to get moving? Thumbs up. Thank you. Bridge Thumbs now. up on this side. Dave, you, side. you ready to get going? Uh, let's do uh, good evening. Let's, let's do go. three zero. Let's <laughs> do two five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Three zero five. Okay. Oh, we have someone lurking in the back as well. <laughs> 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 Just that? wanted to sit in the freezing cold air conditioning with you. <laughs> oh, we should check. No Megan, moving. you ready to get moving? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Part one of us. I'm here to stage bomb Adam through some sound bites for a production piece. Perfect. Yeah. We love setting up Adam for things. It's uh, an adaptation of Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> I've done. I'm so bad. I can't quote anything from Shakespeare. Can anyone quote anything? I was about to have you do that next. I mean, out damn spot. That's about all I have. That's Macbeth, I think. Yeah, we need to bleep that now. Thanks. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Out darn spot, as Shakespeare once said. <laughs> Where are we going? We're going two two five. That's not that the right. 
This is not the right way. Yeah, I don't know where you're going. <laughs> it's, uh, if no you didn't get that, listens. it's 225-er. Two, 225-er? Two, <laughs> five, two, two, five by five. <laughs> Do you have additional questions? Follow up questions? Are you my also, mommy? Also, the USB has been really. <laughs> yeah, it is. Sorry. The USB has been really noisy. Uh, yeah, why don't you reset that action? That looks. Well, are you stopped? <laughs> hands, <laughs> <laughs> hands off the joystick. Yeah, I don't think it's the problem. Is it's not us? Um, let us be trying to figure out what the issue is, but. Probably Atlanta. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I would blame it on the Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Not today. Thank you, already have. <laughs> Do what I can. <laughs> okay. Try that. Science, do we have any uh, initial goals, or you want to just keep us moving? Yeah. Um, no, we're heading uphill here, but word on the street is we do not have a lot of sample capacity left. Really? Wow. We've got three slurp jars and one bio box, and then wow. we start doubling up. Okay, so we keep moving. All right, when our um, 8 to 12, when you're ready, why don't we start with our introductions? And speaking of Shakespeare. Oh, no. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> oh, boy. Nope. Ooh, I hope it's what's your favorite player musical. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. <laughs> your fa no, okay, no. Um, speaking of Shakespeare, made me think. You name your favorite. Um, it could be a book or a musical. Musical. <laughs> a book okay. or music. Yeah. Shakespeare? But oh. Give you guys a little room Shakespeare did neither of those. <laughs> <laughs> neither of those. Um, Shakespearean? Hey. Okay. Does Focus it have to it. be related? Okay. All right. Uh, boy. Uh, Adam Sewell. I'm a uh, watch lead here, 8 to 12, professor at University of Rhode Island, director of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. I'm a submarine volcanologist. And my favorite book and or musical <laughs> <laughs> is of course going to be revealed later because I cannot think of it. <laughs> what? Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> he took a rain check. I took yeah, a your rain first check. rain check. Okay, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Jules. I work at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, I am a marine biologist and um, I don't know about a favorite, but right now I'm reading a book called Other Minds. It's about evolution of consciousness in cephalopods. Ooh. Great book. Nice. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Paula Santiago. I am this watch data logger and this expedition science intern. I am a marine biology from Puerto Rico and work on coral restoration. And my favorite book is The Alchemist. Oh, that's a good the book. The Alchemist. Uh, the Alchemist. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you. So well, hello, everybody. My name is Annie Halleck. I'm the 8 to 12 Science Communication Fellow. This is my first year sailing on, on Nautilus. Um, I am from Pango Pango, American Samoa. I am a local educator back home teaching marine science and biology. My favorite book would be uh, Tolkien, the Tolkien series, the Lord of the Rings series, and musical. Well, I'm musical. I'll go oh, for both. I'll double dip. <laughs> nice. um, I've only seen this once. It's Phantom of the Opera, uh, the show in Honolulu when oh, they had their show there. Nice. Ooh, okay. Yes. Front row, let's go. Dave. No, not, not, <laughs> this, <laughs> time, <laughs> Samantha. not this time. Uh, Samantha Wishnack, navigator on the 8 12. Uh, also the operations coordinator for Ocean Exploration Trust, which is the nonprofit that uh, operates Nautilus. So I get to work with all of our teams um, on expedition planning and also sailing out here as expedition leader or uh, navigator. Um, I will answer the musical question. Uh, I was recently telling someone about this, but um, I was in a musical called Assassins back in high school. Um, and it was all about uh, 
presidential assassins or attempted assassins and it was a Stephen Sondheim musical the songs were amazing and it was really interesting social commentary um, expressed through uh, through song oh that's cool neat Robert and what part did you uh, play? Robert Waters I'm the hurt pilot uh, OET's facility manager and ROV engineer uh, favorite, favorite musical mm -hmm. Favorite musical would be Paint Your Wagon. Ah, that a boy. Classic. And favorite book would be Ring World by Larry Niven. Uh, wow. Oh. Oh. What is this yeah, down here? Classic. Can we just look real quick? Yep. Thanks. I'll throw in favorite Shakespeare play then. Since we're <laughs> much to do about nothing. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. What is this? Can we uh, zoom in, is Dave? A fish? Is it a Holotherian? Holotherian. Holotherian. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Is that the buzzer? <laughs> Don't say that in front of it. You usually say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I do. No, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at its little feet. That is not the scientific word for that. But Xenophile 4. Right? And the lasers. Oh, yes. All right, you're up, Mike. Oh, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, my name is Mike Burns. I am the Glass adolescent. Glassboro. <laughs> 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 uh, right. Avalanche pilot on the uh, eight to twelve shift. Uh, also the uh, lead deck chief for the back deck here on Nautilus. Um, I am currently residing in. <laughs> Glassboro, New Jersey, Glassboro. Yeah. New Jersey, <laughs> originally Woo. from Hawaii. <laughs> Mike, the question was, what's your favorite musical or book? <laughs> ah, there we go. Uh, favorite uh, book would probably be the uh, Horatio Hornblower series by C.S. Forrester. And my favorite musical, I just went to a Broadway play uh, that was Hercules. Was it a play or a musical? I mean, it's a musical play. Okay. <laughs> well, it's uh, great. It's fantastic. <laughs> Was so, uh, is the cartoon animation what? Hercules? Ah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so it's even better. Hercules was this. It was not this Hercules. Not this. Like Hercules. the Disney movie. Like the <laughs> Disney movie. Yeah. Amazing. Ah, okay. It was really good. Oh wait, you saw it. There was a stage was show of the animation. Watching what? an iPad. <laughs> stage show. Watching an iPad on Broadway. Of the animation. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Yep. I have to look that one up. Were you wearing a suit? <laughs> I, uh, I, up. I I don't own a suit, but, you know, I dressed up in my deck chief ways. <laughs> <laughs> An unfaded t-shirt. best <laughs> cargo uh, pants. Uh, uh, I won't say Shiniest I was not wearing steel toes. Steel toes. <laughs> steel toes. What if something got dropped? <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, I had pants. <laughs> yeah, what is that? Can we yeah. zoom in there? Bridge, now. Tough act to follow there. Add another three zero meters, uh, two two five. What? What? Oh, is, is that, that lobster? Oh, cool. Oh, that flat guy, but just yeah. half buried. Yeah, hiding. Yeah. Does it work? <laughs> or tucked in for bed. What? Yeah, it's like tucked in. <laughs> it's it's bedtime. Okay. Okay. Cool. Megan, you're here in the van. Yes, so we Dave's not um, off the hook. I'll go. Hey. Dave, <laughs> when, when Dave, Dave. our Dave. special guest. I'm busy. I'm busy. Oh, okay. Joe's All right. Day, I think. I'll go. Dave oh. Robertson, uh, oh. lead video engineer. Uh, I'll, I'll and work on sitting that. in the video chair. No worries. The, uh, I'll type something. Eight to five. And Samantha, no. What is eight that? Eight to five. Thing? Yeah, we know what it is. Yeah. What is it? I said it was a lobster tucked in for bed. It's a <laughs> flat <laughs> a lobster. It's a scientific name. Yeah, it's <laughs> possible. Sleepy lobster. Yes. Sorry, Dave. That's all right. Um, lobster sleepy <laughs> <laughs> Uh I'm going to do favorite book and favorite musical. Okay, yes. let's go. Uh, favorite book, Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. Mm. Oh. Good book. Um, which I read at an impressionable young age, like when I was in junior high school, but what? Um, if you haven't read it, go find it. Uh, favorite musical, wow, it's down to two, and uh, and I've uh, had, uh, I'll go with the one that I was in. 
uh, and that was Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm. Ooh. Wow. Nice. I, was in the, I was in the band for that. Oh, what? Oh, what? what were you playing in the band? Me? Oh, you name it. Uh, I could play it. Uh, I played uh, auxiliary percussion, I played bass guitar, and I played um, tuba. Oh, wow. And, uh, 